and see what I can find. I think I'll be a coach driver. I don't like um, the big boys hitting us and the prefix sending us out, out for nothing. I know I'd prefer to be alone, really. And when I said that, I know, I know even now, I meant that. You know, if someone dropped me out in the Sahara Desert, <laughs> I probably would have been happy more or less if you get the point. to eat what they cook to and, and say I don't like greens, well I don't um, and so she said you have to eat what, what you get, give so I, I don't like greens, so she gives me greens and, that, and that's it I find it hard to express emotion most of the time although I'm, I'm getting on top of that more than that, you know I mean, just a simple thing to say to sort of Susan, you know, I love you, something like that. I mean, I, could, I can tell you about it, but um, I, I really haven't been able to say it freely to Sue, you know. <laughs> Did he propose to you? <laughs> yeah, it was strange. We went off and bought the engagement ring first. <laughs> and then I said to him, you haven't really proposed to me. <laughs> As you can gather, he's sort of very shy. <laughs> What yes. was it that you fell in love with? What is it about him? His helplessness, I suppose. It was the motherly instinct in me to pick him up and cuddle him. And he's also very good looking, I think, but he doesn't agree with me. <laughs> <laughs> and in, in the summer, he's got this cute little bum in shorts. <laughs> Paul and Susan live in Melbourne, Australia. Four years ago, they sold everything they had, bought an old Bedford van, and went on a trip through Western and Central Australia. It took seven months and they traveled 15,000 miles. I think it brought us closer together because you know, we really got to know each other and re relied on each other so much. Yeah, I'd never been so relaxed in my life. I, I felt a lot more confident in myself. Just great fun, really. No pressures or worries, or you know, everything was forgotten. When we got to Perth, I was ready to fly home. Being together so much, it, it was hard. But then we settled down, and we must have settled down really well because we, we got pregnant. I got pregnant, and, <laughs> and everything. So something must have been up. going right. <laughs> I think it's now like people like to get back to nature and, and like to feel that, that they aren't living in the 20th century. That to me it's, it's just like an old dream that you, you wish you could come true, you know, living next to nature and like pioneers type of thing. I love the place, you know. I, I find it hard to put into words really what, what it is. You've got the country, you, you've got bush out back. You can do more or less anything you want I think here. Whether you can do that in England, I don't know. I think that this is the part we enjoyed the most because we really went out in the middle of nowhere where we had to carry our own petrol and our own water to do us for the three or four days that we were out that way. And While we were up in Carnarvon, we went and stayed on a, a sheep station up there with our friend from Melbourne, Bruce. And um, it was about a million acres, just under a million acres, the, the, the sheep station. Bruce from Yannery Station, he got a hold of some tails from the roo shooter so we could try a uh, kangaroo tail stew. Yeah, it's um, a bit rough. Yeah, <laughs> we had nothing bit to throw silly. Yeah. It gave us our own peace of mind that we could settle down and, and now have a family, that we had done something. We hadn't just been nobodies and lived in suburbia all our lives. We, we'd done something that we were proud of, that you know, we'd accomplished on our own. Do you want this for the children? I'd love it yeah. for the children. I was once told when I was at school that travel could be the best education and, and living 
in um, conditions where you have to fend for yourself and you have to use your own initiative is very good and I would like it. I was going to be a policeman but I thought how hard it would be to join in. I just haven't made up my mind yet. I was going to be a phys ed teacher but uh, one of the teachers told me that uh, you had to get up into university. At 21, Paul was working as a junior partner for a firm of bricklayers in Melbourne. I'm not great at bricklaying, right? But if I wasn't good enough and my boss didn't think I was good enough, he would have never have made me a junior partner. I went out on my own as a subcontractor not long after the last show. But then I started with the partner. I, I organised everything. I bought all the equipment because I didn't want to be dependent on someone else. Things didn't work out between the two of us. He was a bit lazy. Do you have the right temperament, do you think, to, to run your own business? If you're talking about employing other people, I, I'm not hard enough. So I'm a little bit slow with, with working out things on the job, not particularly the, the laying of the bricks, but fairly slow thinker when you've got to work something out. I think that'll end up being my job for life, probably. Not that I want it that way because it uh, gets harder as you get older, I think. I've got 23 th new pieces, and I don't know how many um, halfpenny pieces I've got now. 3DB 26 past 10 with Doug Ackerley, 15 degrees in Melbourne. At the moment, 25... They live in a working-class suburb of Melbourne. Paul earns £12,000 a year, owns two cars, and bought his house for £35,000 18 months ago. We're Mr. and Mrs. Average. That's just true. You know, we, we probably earn an average income. Just an average family. Oh, good fist away by Russo up towards centre wing. Robertson this time behind. Uh, Susan works part time as a hairdresser, and they have two children, Katie and Robert. Are you ambitious for your children, Paul? I said something about wanting Robert to be a brain surgeon. That was a joke. I mean, like, if he's a brain surgeon, it wouldn't well, but, but it'd be nice to let them go one step up from us, I think. Put it this way, I hope he's better at school work than I was, so that, that he's got a choice, you know, because really, with the education standard I got, I didn't have a choice. What does university mean? Paul started his school life at a children's home near London. When he was eight, he emigrated to Australia with his father. Were you happy at the children's home in England? We didn't mind that really, because we didn't know what was going on, because we were a bit young. What regrets do you have about your education then? I didn't work hard enough. I was just very lazy at school. So, you know, if you're lazy and you don't work at school, it, you suffer for it. There needs to be a little bit more discipline. If private schools are better, you'd be far better off spending your money sending your kids there than getting a video or new television swimming pool or something like that, I think. What else do you want for your kids that you didn't have? A happier family life, I think. Well, don't get me wrong, it wasn't miserable. So I think it could have been better. I think that would be one of the most important things. My mother and father got... Well, they separated originally, I think. Um, they eventually got divorced. I went to the boarding school for one year and then we immigrated to Australia. My father got remarried. Um, and how did you get on with your stepmom? Pretty well, but like I said before, I mean, I'm not, I'm not just not close, I'm not really close to my father either. Is that the biggest Emily, job you ever had? Really? No. What's up, please? Do you have any regrets about the fact that you weren't closer to him when you were young? Yeah, I suppose that's all, all wasted time in a way, I suppose. I mean, he was always there, you know, I could always talk to him, but it, it was different. We were sort of distant friends. I mean, we always got along fairly well. We didn't see much of each other. Say hi to Pop. Say, say hello to Pop. He's Grandad. Hey. He's Grandad. He said, actually, to, to his wife, Barbara, that um, he, missed, he missed out on his own children. He's not going to miss out on those. Divorce was something new to me until I grew up and was, knew what the meaning of it all really was. There was no divorces in our family. I think of what Paul's been through. I mean, Paul doesn't say it's very bad, but I wouldn't like that for my children. It does worry me, you know, because it happens so much these days. 
Only time will tell what happens. Divorcing your wife, what does it get you? It messes up your own life, messes up your kids' life, your wife's life. I don't think half the people that get divorced even think about it properly. What mark has it left on you, the fact that you were brought up within a bad marriage? The only thing I can say that I think might have come from that is just my lack of confidence and being able to show my feelings, really, I suppose. He, he is down on himself. He has this excuse where he says, I'm only a bricklayer, I don't... He's got nothing to do with me. I, I don't know why it is. I, I get really frustrated with him. I want to wring his neck sometimes when he does it. But um, he's getting better. So do you feel there's any conflict ahead with Sue wants a, a job and a career? What's come up so far since we've been married, we've handled that. Really, I think Susan probably be, be the best one to start a, be a businesswoman I stay at home, you know. I have to push him out the house. Sometimes I think he needs a bit of extra male companionship because he, being a bricklayer, he only works with one fellow and he doesn't, we don't have a, a social life with work type of thing. Well, he doesn't because there's only just one person as well as himself. And, um, and his basketball, I, I, I think he really enjoys it, but he doesn't really let on how much he enjoys it. I suppose you could see me now when I was seven in a way. Like, I, I think it was pretty obvious I wasn't going to be a doctor. You seem such a sad little boy. That's me, though. <laughs> when I was pretty, you know, long face, <laughs> sort of thing. I was like that sometimes out here too. I was always getting knocked about that. I don't like greens when I don't. The first show I saw was at 21. And when I saw him at 7, I just wanted to cry. He seemed so pathetic. He... I, I, I suppose it's... I don't know, it's hard to say. It really made me go to jelly inside, you know, to, to see him like that. And do you think it's true that we can see the man in the, in the seven-year-old boy? Yeah, yes it is, because in that he was a very gentle and, and um, not gentle, a caring person, yeah, he's always cared about other people and always been able to work his way, talk his, try to give an explanation for, for saying something he doesn't really want to do, you know, like what if I didn't like to eat my greens and all that sort of thing, I mean, He's always still does that, the what if, you know, what if, and then you know, well, he doesn't really want to do that, so he's trying to talk <laughs> himself out of it. Yeah, yeah. Does he eat greens now? He loves them. He loves them. <laughs> he loves them. What do you remember of England? Uh, it seemed to be raining all the time. I wouldn't stake my life on it. But We've got a lot more than what we would have in England from what other people tell us. But there again... I, when it came, comes to work, I, I don't sit down on my backside, I'll go and chase it. So it's hard to say. But I, I'd say, like, in general, you, I probably, I've probably done better here than what I would have there. Family's going to come first, but I'm, st I'm still going to be working, and then we'll progress. You I'd know? love Paul to build me a house, and I know that he'd be happy once he's done it. Something yeah. like he's got his children, and then to build his own home, it really would be the icing on the cake for both of us. I read the Financial Times. I read Observer and the Times. What do you like about it? Well, I like, I usually look at the headlines and then read about the, what, about it. Yeah. I like my newspaper because I've got shares in it and I know every day what the, stuff the shares like misers are. like you like. <laughs> No, but, but every, on Mondays they don't move up so I don't look at it. What's the point of the program? It's the point of the program is to reach a comparison. I don't think it is. Because we're not necessary typical examples. I think that's what people seeing the programme might think. Yes. Falsely. 
I mean, no, they, they tend to, to typecast us. So everything we say, they'll think, oh, that's a typical result of the public school system. Yes. I mean, do you think there's any truth in the ideas behind the programme, that certain people have more options than others? It's certainly true that poor pe more, more people know they have more options or imagine they have. I think in practical terms, the difference in numerical number of options isn't that great. But the mere knowledge creates an option in exactly, itself. Yes. So I think we I do have more options. It. And it is undesirable, yeah. but it's very difficult to correct. I don't think it is undesirable at, at all. I think what's undesirable is people who have had options don't make advantage of them, take, take best advantage of them. When I leave the school, I'm going to call it court. And then I will be going to Westminster boarding school if I pass the exam. And then we think I'm going to um, Cambridge in Trinity Hall. John went to Westminster school and at 21 was in his final year reading law at Christ Church, Oxford. I do believe parents have a right to educate their children as they think fit. And I think someone who works on the assembly line in some of these car factories and earning huge wage could well afford to send their children to, to private school if they wanted to. Just because some sorts of people perhaps don't put that as high on their priorities as you know, having a, a smart car or something. I'm going to charter house and after that Trinity Hall, Cambridge. Andrew went to charter house and read law at Trinity College, Cambridge. And you can never be sure of leaving your children any worldly goods, but at least you can be sure that once you've given them a good education, that's something that no one can take away. When I leave school, I'm going to the Dragon School. I might, and Mum is, and I might go to. After I might go to Charter House, Marlborough, and I can't. I can't remember all other places, but. Because Mummy's got so many, but there's uh, some of them. What about university, uh, Charles? I might go to Oxford. Charles went to Marlborough, but didn't make it to Oxford. Instead, he went to Durham University. I say, I'm, I'm pleased I didn't, because there's very much a sort of... certain Marlborough prep school. Marlborough, Oxbridge, conveyor belt shoved out at the end and when you go to Oxford and it's obviously not true in all cases but I think for the majority they mix with the same people as they were with at school and so on. When they were 21 we asked them what they thought they would be doing at 28. John. Might be at the bar. Doing what? Perhaps transfer practice. How do you see your life at 28? What do you want for yourself then? I'd quite like to be married by then. John has just announced his engagement. He is a successful barrister in the Chancery Division of the High Court. At 21, these were his thoughts about his career. Law sort of interests me. I think it's sort of good life. It's, it's hard work, but you sort of, when you get to a certain eminence, you know, you take the work you want and you take the holidays you want and you don't really dance to anyone's tune, all of which quite suits me. And what about Charles? I'd say probably scribbling away in some basement for some London newspaper or something. Charles did scribble away for an East London newspaper. He moved on after a year and joined the BBC, where he now works as an assistant producer. And Andrew, what did he want? I'd like to be a solicitor, and also fairly successful. Andrew is a solicitor, working for a large firm in the city. What qualities do you think it needs to be successful? Well, you have to have a, a legal ability in my business, obviously, and you have to have a sort of bedside manner as far as your clients are concerned. Because it's no good being brilliant if you can't really if you can't communicate with your clients. What do you think about girlfriends at your age? Um, I've no, got one, but I don't think much of her. The right. girls never, never, 
never do what the boys want them. They always no. start playing with dolls when the boys want to play rough and tumble with it's them. It's quite yeah. true. I don't think I financially come from the same background. Mm, um, Andrew didn't go for a haughty Deb. He went for a good Yorkshire lass. But, I mean, obviously he knew what he wanted. Andrew and Jane were married 18 months ago. I think I'm probably quite down to earth and I tend to be less extravagant than maybe some women are. Um, I don't go back out and buy lots of expensive dresses. I just go out and buy one or two. <laughs> <laughs> and even better pay for them. <laughs> they spend their weekends in the Sussex countryside where they are converting an old barn which they bought with financial help from their parents. They plan to live in it permanently when they start a family. During the week, they have a flat in London, and Jane has a full-time job as a secretary. I think it's not a bad idea to pay for schools, because if we didn't, schools would be so nasty and crowded. Yes. So do I think so. Yes. And, and the people in yes. the schools wouldn't... And, and the, poor people the, the, would come rushing the in. The man in mm. charge of the school would get very would, angry. Would get a, very angry because he and would he'd get he wouldn't he would he wouldn't he wouldn't be able to pay all the masters if he didn't yes. get any money. Well, I've never really experienced the state system, but I think you get a better level of education if you can go to a private school. Do you think it's bad that people like you opt out of the state system? Well, there are really two arg counter-arguments. First of all is the argument that people should have the choice if they've earned the money to spend it. And then the other argument is that if we all went to the same sort of schools, um, those schools would probably be better because those people who had influence would do their utmost to make sure they were better if they had to send their children there. Whereas they just look back and don't particularly care what happens in the state system. And what do you feel about that? Well, I think probably the latter choice is fairly impractical. So I suppose that one has to continue with the idea of everyone having a choice. Once I had a talk to Greville, he was in my house. And, and I asked Sir uh, if he could put him out <coughs> of my house because he was always getting minuses. Looking when back on our film of us at seven, certainly I was a fairly precocious little brat. And I hope I'm no longer... Do you still read the Financial Times? No. Mustn't be late there. I should, uh, quite quietly, it's a very nonchalant little theme. Well, yes, I do feel I've, I've had the best of everything as far as education is concerned. But, I mean, you know, to get here, I had to work very hard. But you don't deny you've had a silver spoon. I think anyone who goes to a really good school has had a leg up. But, I mean, I wouldn't say I'd had been, you know, been unduly privileged if I missed the exam to my school and had to go to a sort of grotty. Got a public school. I, I would have thought I had any advantage at all. Yes, I must say, all, all this talk about opportunities, it's something I did, did slightly object to in, in the programmes. We were shown at the age of seven, outlining sort of the academic sort of career that most of us you know, will, did in fact pursue. You know, each sentence ended up, you know, John is at Westminster, Andrew is at Charterhouse and everything, implying that we just sailed through, you know, merely manifesting an intention at the age of seven. We didn't show the sleepless nights, the sort of pouring over our books, the sort of, you know, all the sweat and toil that, that got us to, to university and things. It was, it was presented as if it was just, you know, part of some indestructible birthright that we went to all, all these places, and I thought that was un unfair. It didn't show us sort of having to do beastly jobs in the holidays, you know, to to make ends meet and things, it, it, it didn't give a very real sort of impression. Do you want to be rich? Well, yes, because I don't want to be tied down to the, to the dullness of an everyday job. I want to be able to have enough money so I can indulge in you know, things that might interest me, like collecting paintings. And... 
I do believe in a sort of ordered and structured society, and I think, you know, we're not exactly alive for very long, and we've each got our, our own job to do, and our own little position to be in. Some people have, have a better time than others, but it, it, you know, it doesn't mean because you sweep the streets you're, you're any less valuable than someone who's you know, running a huge corporation. I mean, not everyone can be at the top, but as long as people are happy in what they're doing, that's, I think, the, the greatest good that can be. And this is what worries me about these new sort of invidious sort of class attitudes that certain sort of subversive elements are, are introducing, or, you know, based on envy and things. John declined to be interviewed at 28. He felt satisfied with what he had said in the previous films and had nothing more to add. Children always make fun of poor children, yes, I think. Yes. yes, they say, oh, look at that lovely little sissy over there. Yes, and, and they like throw that. things at them. I don't particularly want to be rich, but I'd like to have enough money. Well, what do you mean by enough? Well, enough to have a, a nice house and, and be able to send the children to a private school if you want to. I really don't see how one's life can be a failure in that if I became a journalist and got sacked at 30, it's probably because I'd grown out of it or I'd changed, so I was no longer suitable, so therefore I'd find something else which was... which I'd find, you know, I enjoyed and which my talents were suited to. Charles has found a career suited to his talents. At the BBC, he makes documentary films. He decided not to take part in this film. I'm quite happy in living in the society that I am living in. It's a shame that more people can't get the opportunities that I've had, and I'm not sure how one deals with that. But you've been lucky, haven't you? What about those who haven't been so lucky? Absolutely. I have been very lucky. Well, we, we pretend we've got swords, and uh, yeah. we make the noise of the swords fighting, and uh, when somebody stabs us, we go, ah! I think if you're healthy and have good friends, you can get on perfectly well. But everybody would like to be rich. Neil was brought up in a Liverpool suburb, went to comprehensive school, and dropped out of Aberdeen University after one term. At 21, he was working as a casual labourer on a building site in London. Uh, I came to London and uh, I contacted an agency for squatters, and they were able to um, give me the address of uh, somebody who was able to help people who were looking for accommodation in the, in the London area. And by the um, process of chasing people around, I eventually managed to, to, to find this place here. I think in, in questions of squatting, um, a bit of humanity is more important than vague rules about uh, who can live where. But you've kicked against the stability that's... I don't think I ever had any stability, to be quite honest. I can't think of any time in my life when I ever did. I don't think I've been kicking against anything. I think I've been kicking in mid-air the whole of my life. The last three years I have, in fact, been unemployed, but travelling quite a bit, mostly in Britain, been abroad once or twice, but not as extensively as I, as I used to do. Thanks. Uh, so put the luggage in here, or do you want it in the back? I the right live off money from Social Security which does me for my rent and my food. I've been moving about a bit between different places, really. I'm a bit unsettled, but I'm very shortly moving to, to live in, in digs. For the last seven years, Neil has been moving around Britain. He spent the summer on a farm in North Wales, and when we found him, he had just arrived in the Western Highlands of Scotland. Do you think people like you who live off the state are scrounging? No. If the state didn't give us any money, it would probably just mean crime. And I'm glad I don't have to, to steal to keep myself alive. I do it simply because I don't want to be without any money at all. If the money runs out, well, then for a few days there's nowhere to go to. And that's just, that's all you can do. I simply have to find them. The warmest shed I can find. 
Neil rents whatever kind of home he can find. The last job I had was cooking in a youth hostel, you know, some, some cleaning work as well. And I was the only person in the hostel who could speak French, so I had to do a bit of that. Do you eat every day? Yes, yes. I, I'm eating better now than I was uh, at times when I was in Aberdeen, and those days, sometimes, I really was short of food. Well, I'm going to take people to the country and sometimes take them to the seaside and and uh, I'll have a big loud speaker in the motor coach and tell them whereabouts we are and what, and what we're going to do and, and what the name of the road is and all about that. There's a lot more to do uh, in the mountains than there would be in a suburb or in the, in the city centre. What I've found here, in fact, is that you don't... You don't talk about things like the weather, because um, the weather is all around. Everybody knows it's been raining, so you don't talk about the weather. That makes, co that makes good sense to me. I'm not the sort of person who can go into a pub, sit down with a drink, and listen to the, listen to the jukebox, and talk a lot of rubbish. Uh, so a lot of people find that very relaxing. But uh, if I'm going to talk to somebody, A, I have to be able to hear myself speaking, and B, I have to be talking about something that actually has a meaning. Uh, I, I don't, I'm not trying to denigrate the way that most people relax. But I, I can't do that, so I'm, I'm lost in a noisy pub. Uh, I'll sit in, the, in a quiet corner of a quiet pub, and then I'll want to talk about literature or something like that, which not everybody will want to. How do people regard you here? Well, I'm still known as an eccentric, as I have been since uh, about the age of 16 or so. Do the days seem long for you? They can do. Do you have any friends anywhere? I have some good friends still in England. I don't think I need to go to university because I'm not going to be a teacher. I moved up to a comprehensive school. I found it much bigger, of course, and I found it hard to settle into at first. I didn't make an application to Oxford, um, but I didn't get in. And, uh, well, I... I think that's that's in the past now, and that's I don't know whether I would have been any happier at, at Oxford. Uh, it, it always had been a dream to get into Oxford. I think because people had encouraged me, and because I knew famous people having been to Oxford. Uh, that is still something that occasionally I, I think about and, and, and think, yes, I I know I could have done well. I've been playing since I started at the comprehensive school since the first year. But I don't think I was half as clever as I was told I was. I think. Unfortunately, I grew up against a background of um, fairly of people of, of, of pretty average intelligence. I don't think I went to a school that was full of bright people. If this had been the case, I don't think I would have been so big-headed. I know I went to university expecting um, to be something of a genius and found that this wasn't the case at all, which is a good thing for me. I mean, it's very good that I didn't, didn't come to that opinion. I don't think I was so much clever. I just think I, I was quite enthusiastic, particularly when it came to A-levels, I, I was enthusiastic about the subjects I was, I was studying and therefore, w w with the help of good teaching, I, w I was able to get good results. What were your results? Well, I did well enough. Um, I'm not going to boast. No, but tell me, tell me the fact. What, how many O-levels and how many A-levels did you get? Well, I, got, I managed, I got ten O-levels and then I got four A-levels. And did you get good grades within them? Yes, the grades were quite satisfactory. Well, I was only taking university seriously for a matter of a couple of months, two or three months. Uh, maybe I went to the wrong university, or maybe university life didn't suit me. No, either way, uh, I, I felt a very great need to get out of the system. No formal education can prepare anybody for life. Just only, only life can, can prepare you for what comes. And somebody, sooner or later, you're going to have to cross certain barriers. And I don't think you ever cross those uh, at school or or at university. You, you come across the problem of mixing with other people, but the real problem, I mean, the, the real problem of, of becoming a success in the world is, is one you have to tackle yourself. Um, On the grass, we, um, we play international wrestling. Yeah, that's all yeah. it's from the time though. Yeah, it's only when we can go on the grass. Being in set one, it's very, very hard to keep up with the leaders. I never have a time to relax at all. I don't know what sort of stumbling blocks should be put in, in a child's way uh, to get him used to, to, to living in the outside world. 
because I, I think maybe this is this is something that, that was wrong in my upbringing. I didn't have enough obstacles to get over. I, I still, I still set myself high standards if I'm doing something I want to do. But that's that's important. That's not that's not too bad a thing. But you talked also about not having enough obstacles in your life. How do you feel about that now? It's funny that, isn't it? I can't remember saying that, but now I do remember. And it seems that the whole situation is, is reversed. In what way? Well, now I'm a, I'm a, I'm a free... I, I've got a free hand, but I've got nothing to do with myself. So... In the winter, if you lived in the country, well, it was just all wet and there wouldn't be anything for miles around. And you get so and you get soaked if you tried to go out and there's no shelter anywhere except in your own house. But in the town you can go out on, on wet, wintry days because you can always find somewhere to shelter because there's lots of places. I don't think I've been, I've been typical of the environment in which I lived. I might still have been unemployed, but what my background has given me is um, a sense of just being part of um, a very impersonal society. The, the suburbs are, the suburbs force this kind of feeling upon somebody. Um, the most you can hope to achieve is is to have the right to climb into a suburban train five or ten times a week and just about stagger back for the weekend. The, the least is, is just unemployment. Great, thanks. Uh, I just needed just a nice woody bed. Roughly yeah, yeah. 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 Great. What other things about modern society turn you off? The cheap satisfaction in so many things. Uh, the aimlessness. But I think the total lack of thought is, is, is at the bottom of it. Nobody seems to know where, where they or anybody else is going, and nobody seems to worry. Um, you know, you, you, finish, you finish the week, you come home, you plug into the TV set for the weekend, and then you manage to get back to work on Monday. And it seems to me that this is just a, a slow path to, to, uh, to total brainwashing. And, and if you have a brainwashed society, then you're heading towards doom. There's no question about that. It would be pretty tough to convince most people that what you have here, the way you live, the way you look, is better than a suburban life. Well, I don't want to convince anybody. I know it is. See, what I look like isn't necessarily what I feel like. I'm not claiming that, that I feel as though I'm in some sort of nirvana. But I'm claiming that if I was living in a bedsit in suburbia, I'd be so miserable, I'd feel like cutting my throat. And so there is a slight difference. When I go home, I come, I come in and Mummy gives me a cup of tea and then I go out and play and, um, and when it starts to get dark, I come in again and put on TV. I don't think um, I was really taught any sort of policy of living at all by my parents. This, this is probably their biggest mistake. That I was just left to fend for myself in a world which they seem completely oblivious of. And uh, I found that even when I tried to discuss problems which were which were facing me in school. Um, my parents didn't seem to be aware of the nature of the problem. We, we made up quite, quite well after um, the bad times we went through when I was in my early 20s. Uh, there's, there's still, there are still awkward patches. But I think suddenly, it, it perhaps, it perhaps almost mutually, it dawned upon us that um, we were all making mistakes and and also that some of the things we did couldn't be helped and I think now perhaps the greatest thing we've achieved is is we know when to say nothing and we know when to do nothing and we know when to be tolerant of each other and that's a great thing that's really tremendous um, I, what I'd like most of all would be um, would be to be able to uh, to do something for my parents when they're or older to be to be there when uh, when the time is necessary. Were they upset with what you said about them in the last program? I'm sure they were. But I, I I I don't wish I hadn't said it because I said what was exactly what was going through my mind. I think I was very venomous, and I think I 
had had I been in an easier situation myself, and I, had I had less worries myself at the time, I would have been perhaps a little kinder. I had to take out my my anger on somebody, and I think it came out of my parents. Um, but perhaps unconsciously, a lot of what I said was was what I did feel underneath. But I, I don't want the scar to to remain. When I get married, I don't want to have any children, be, because. They are always doing naughty things and making the whole house untidy. I, I always told myself that um, I would never have children. Why? Because, because, well, because children inherit something from their parents. And even if my wife were the most um, high-spirited and ordinary and normal of people, um, the child would still stand a very fair chance of being not totally uh, full of happiness because of what he or she will have inherited from me. Cold people, we oh, don't wow. like them very much. No, it's, it's hard with ghostly coloured people. Hmm. Do you think of a, of a purple person with yeah. red eyes yeah. and yellow feet? And it, don't, uh, <laughs> it can't really think of what, what, it really, what they really look like. What goes through your mind when you look at those, saw those two films, when you were at seven, bright and <coughs> perky and... <coughs> I, I find it hard to believe that I was ever like that, but there's the, there's the evidence. I wonder why I was like that. I wonder what it was inside me that made me like that. And I can see even at 14 that I was beginning to get more subdued and I was putting a lot more thought into what I was saying, to a ridiculous degree. Um... And probably when I was seven, I just, I don't know, I, I lived in a wonderful world where everything was, was sensation and dumb. I could be happy like this, I could be miserable next minute. I know at seven years old I was fascinated by, by everything around me. Um, the colours of things and things that were funny, sounds that things made. I had, if you like, idiosyncratic views about things that other people hadn't even thought about. Um, I remember I thought that, that coloured people had, had purple noses and green legs or something like that. Uh, perhaps I'm still, I'm still looking for, for it's, it's difficult to explain, so perhaps I'm still looking for the, the green nose and this sort of thing. And I know that, that they're still there. I know that when you look at a, at a human being, you, that there's, more, there's more to that, that person than just a, just a robot. When I grow up, I want to be an astronaut, but if I can't be an astronaut, I think I'll be a coach driver. This is probably linked up with the fact now that I want to travel. I mean, my thoughts haven't really changed differently. I definitely wouldn't like to be a coach driver now. I suppose I would. Uh, yes, well, I would like to be somebody in a position of importance, and I've always thought this. Um, but I don't think I'd, I'm, I'm the right sort of person to carry the responsibility for whatever it is. I always thought, well, I'd love to be... <laughs> possibly even love to be in politics or something like this but um, I suppose that I'd probably find that just as tedious as, uh, as, as, well, as all the other jobs I've done so. oh, all the things I always thought I could do uh, I could give lectures on, on erudite subjects that I'd read all about or I could, I could work in the theatre uh, perhaps lighting or uh, directing a, a show. And is all that lost to you? It does seem to be, yes. I don't see any way out. I thought of everything I possibly could. It seemed to me for a long time that getting a, a, a reliable job and a, a nice place to live would be the solution. Well, I haven't succeeded. Um, I can't see any immediate future at all. But here I am, I'm still, um, I've still got clothes on my back, not particularly nice clothes, but I've still got them. Um, I, I have a place to go to. Uh, I have some prospects of work. I'm still applying for, for jobs I haven't given up. Uh, I, think, I think I'm lucky because I've met so many people. I've worked with people who have no future whatsoever, uh, for whom life is finished completely at 50, and yet they still have to somehow keep going. And... Uh, I don't want it to, to, 
to, to seem that I'm that I'm complaining too much. I feel, especially sometimes when I'm um, on my own, that I'm losing touch with the way other people live. Do you worry about your sanity? <laughs> um, other people sometimes worry about it. Like who? I, as I said, I, I sometimes can be found behaving in, 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 in an erratic fashion. Um, I sometimes get very frustrated, very angry, for, for no apparent reason, for a reason which, which won't be apparent to other people around me. Um, it's happened from time to time. Have you had treatment? I've occasionally had to see doctors, yes. I haven't had any treatment. And what have they said to you? I've had a lot of advice. Uh, but, but, you know, the best medicine is, is kind words. And it usually comes from somebody who has nothing to do with the medical profession. Which isn't to say that, that doctors can't, uh, can't be very helpful. But really, the thing a sick person wants is to be as w away from doctors as soon as possible. What did they say was wrong with you? Well, I have always had a nervous complaint. I had it since I was 16. It was responsible for my leaving university and for some of my difficulties with, with work. But as you know, you, you can't afford to go around looking depressed. That in itself is bad enough. So can you lick it? It remains to be seen. Yes, I'd say I believed in God. Are you religious? Well, I go to church with my parents on Sundays. Uh, I don't know even now whether I do believe in God or not. I've thought an awful lot about it, actually. And uh, I still don't know. But still, this was absolutely certain. One, If one was to, to survive in the world, one had to believe in God. I don't think of God as a creature. But I think of something, um, time destiny which is regulating everybody's affairs and which you cannot you cannot fight against and you cannot order about and how's he been treating you <laughs> well I said to somebody uh, last week that I preferred the Old Testament to the New Testament because in the Old Testament God is very unpredictable uh, and that's I think uh, how I, I've seen him in in my life sometimes uh, very benevolent, sometimes seemingly needlessly unkind. If we come back in seven years, how would you like us to find you? In a job from which I was getting satisfaction. Married. Probably with children. With a good salary. Enough to as I said before, to, to be able to live fairly comfortably. Um, and with friends whom I could contact when I wanted to. I'm a lot happier now than when I was seven years ago. I'm more content. I don't, I don't have such dreadful yearnings. I don't feel so hopelessly as if everything is against me. Do you think, what a waste? Yeah, perhaps. Why should you accept this? You're better than all this, aren't you? No, I'm not better than anything or, or anybody. I'm just somebody uh, with, with my own particular difficulties, my own particular obstacles to, to surround. And everybody else is doing exactly the same thing. Love Jeffrey, and we all want to marry him. Yeah. I think I know the one that he'd like. Jackie, Lynn, Susan. After primary school, they separated, and at 14, Lynn was at grammar school, and Jackie and Susan were at comprehensive. We had a teacher at school, but uh, his favourite ploy was um, all you girls want to do get is walk married. out, yeah. get married, have babies, and push a pram down the street with a fag hanging outside your mouth. Yeah. Women are, are expanding into so many different areas now that it, it must be getting easier and 
I mean, I could... Susan has been married four years and has a son of two. Her husband, Billy, is a gas fitter and they live in a council house in the East End of London. I'm lucky, I, I expect, because I still manage to, to do my own thing. I've got a, a husband who lets me do what I want and a mum who helps me out. You know, and I do a little part-time job, which is enough for me, because I don't think I could cope with a full-time job and I wouldn't want to, personally. 60! Jackie was married at 19 and her husband is a decorator. She works for an insurance company in the city. I certainly don't want to stay in the, the position I am at the moment, forever and ever. Um, but how ambitious, I'm not really sure. It tends to uh, change as you get older, so just got to wait and see, really. Lynn also married at 19. Her husband works for the post office and they have two daughters. They moved out of the East End to Kent 18 months ago. I'm going to work in Walworth. At 21, Lynn was working in a mobile library in Tower Hamlets. She's still there. My stamp chores? Yes. Yes, not stamp chores. Sleeping Beauty. Teaching children the beauty of books and watching their faces as books unfold to them is just fantastic. To work with children of that age, you've got to love them. And I love children. Well, I know he is her and he... That's I don't. I love you. <laughs> I don't think I'd uh, get married too early. <clears throat> I'd like to have a full life first and meet people. And, I... Yeah, before you go and yeah. meet yourself to a family. If you think that getting married, as far as we're concerned, is a case of going to work, come home, cook tea for hubby, going to bed, coming, getting up, going to work, you, you're totally mistaken. Did you meet enough men before you decided who to marry? I've been married a year and a couple of months. Um, you do think, Christ, what have I done? See, I've still got my And I'm being honest about it. Mm. And Russ thinks the same. You think, at times, you think, Christ, what have I done? It is a partnership marriage, yes. Um, we married, say ominously, young. Um, but because we wanted to go out and have fun together. And, and grow together. I'm not sure I would recommend it. I think uh, if, but again, you're, you're generalising. I mean, if I, I would say on average, 19 is probably too young. I've had a good time up until I was 24. And uh, I think that to get married young, there must be things that you miss. You must miss that crucial stage of being yourself because the minute you get married, you're no longer a, a single person being your partnership and that should be the idea behind it. If I could I would have um, two girls and two boys. Yes, I would I. And what about you, Jackie? My mum, because she got five girls, shared them with seven, um, seven years bad luck, that's why she's got five girls. I'd like to be able to have a happy family. I mean, I know that's not possible to be happy all the time, but as much of the time that was possible. Go through there, that's the nursery. Yeah. <laughs> Got any plans? Oh, do me a favour. At 21, Jackie had moved into a new house. She has decided not to have any children. Basically, I would say because I'm far too selfish. I enjoy doing what I want, when I want and how I want. And uh, certainly at the moment, I, I, I can't see any way around that. It's not to say that that's a, a, a forever decision. Some people can make it work. I just don't think I, I, I could. You don't think you're missing out on what on they have their stake in the future? No. That's a very, actually, that's a no, terrible, I, I terrible that, way to put yeah. it, you know. I mean, that, that makes you sound like you're saying, right, great, we're going to have a child. And, mm. and that, that's us. I do feel to a degree that, yes, I am missing out. But I also think that I get far more pleasure or I'm gaining far more experience by not having that tie. When I got married, the primary reason was because I wanted to have a child. Uh, the two, to me, went together. I can understand Jackie's decision because I think there's still a lot of pressure put on um, 
young married couples to have children as though it's, it's expected of them and I think it's all wrong. It's just a personal decision that everyone's entitled to make. And knowing what it does to your life, I can fully understand someone who decides not to. What would you do if you had lots of money about um, me? Two pounds. I would buy myself a new nurse house, you know, one yeah. that's all nice and comfy. You get depressed by money problems? No, why? Why should you? If you can manage your money. you to get got. depressed over money. I, it's I, so I easy to. But I why do. should you? Why when I reach the me? 18th day of the month and my mortgage is due on the 20th and there's nowhere near enough money in there, I get depressed about it, obviously. What money? <laughs> it was hard, first of all, when I gave up work from having a, a fairly high salary um, to nothing was hard. But uh, you, you get used to it, whatever your circumstances are. Um, you live in them, you get used to them and you cope. Everybody does. I don't feel like uh, going to a grammar school. I just, uh, you know, comprehensive school, it just seemed more friendly, you know, at the time that is, but now, you know, really different. Grammar school's fantastic. <laughs> 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 We've had that it doesn't scratch the bottom. Why am I using wooden spoon, please, to stir this saucepan? I don't think anybody influenced me. It was a conscious decision. Obviously, the decision was discussed at home, but it was always in me to go. There may come a time, perhaps later on, when I'll regret not having... It's like we're talking about examination results, really. That's, all we're, that's what it boils down to. And uh, I got some examination results, some O-levels and CSEs, whatever. Didn't need them for the jobs I decided to do, so... With this school, we do metalwork and woodwork, and the boys do cookery. I mean, we get a share of everything, sort of thing. Most parents would want every advantage they can get for their child. Now, whether you class going to grammar school as an advantage is dependent on your entire outlook. If you don't class it as an advantage, then you're not going to push that. My mum left me, she knew I could go to grammar, and... I decided that I didn't want, did want to, to, and she and encouraged me in the choice that I made. That's and right. right or wrong, that was my choice, as much as I was capable of making a decision. And uh, I enjoyed myself. My father had uh, a reasonably good education. He never went to the local comprehensive. But at the same time, I don't think he was, he was, he was too worried which way I decided to go. I think he probably knew me better than I did which was that basically I was a very lazy person academically and I think I would have found grammar school push. Do you I... have any regrets about it? Um, no, no. You can only have regrets about things if you're not happy with the way you are. You look at the old film and you see yourselves at seven. Do you think you've changed? No, I don't think I have really. Mm. We're the same people as we were then. I was always chatty, Jackie was always chatty, and Nim was always the quieter one. Is that depressing or frightening to think that we're all set by the time we're seven and that's it? I don't think one's set by that age. You progress, but the overall character is there to come up. I think the basics and are there. Yeah, the basics are there. And why is it that you three haven't changed so much, do you think? You probably never know that. I think perhaps we've I mean, grown we've all up. <laughs> We've all had stable, <laughs> a stable background with stable relationships all the way through. I mean, mm. the same people are there now that were there then. The part is that you don't help them, they sort of die soon, wouldn't they? Well, some people are just born into rich families and they're lucky. I don't, I don't see why they should have the luck when people have worked all their lives and haven't got half as much as what they have. It just don't seem fair. I've had the opportunities in life that I've wanted. I say I've you've had made. more opportunities. Not, yeah, listen. you've made. So you three working class girls don't feel bitter about a society that maybe gives one strata of it more opportunities than another? No. <laughs> not bitter. Not, not at all. Um, <clears throat> I don't even think, to be honest, we consciously think, think about, about it until it. this programme are... comes up once every seven years. <laughs> I really don't think we even think I mean, about it. I do not sit there you thinking, say, oh, he actually I mean, was I... born into money. He's had more opportunity. I mean, it, it just doesn't, it doesn't even cross my mind. I think that we all could have gone 
in any way that we wanted to at the time within our capabilities. I mean, we just we chose our own jobs. Uh, we were able to choose our own jobs quite freely. If you've got a comfortable background, then perhaps it can make life easy. But I think yeah. you've also seen within this program that it doesn't always work that way. In some respects, I think that uh, the boys and Susie didn't have such an open choice as we had. It was mapped out from such an early age as to where they were going and they had to live up. It's a hard thing living up to parental expectations. <laughs> expectations. Well, I'm old enough to get to job. Uh, I just walk around and see what I can find. I was going to be a film star, but now I'm going to be a, an electrical engineer, which is more to reality. Really. I often say I'm saving to settle down with Yvonne. And then I think to myself, oh, I might buy a car instead. Um, since 21, I've got married. Had a couple of kids. And, um, well, I don't think there's anybody else I could have ever married except Yvonne. It gives me my life, really, because we're together, we have the children and everything. And what is it with Yvonne that you fell in love with? Her nature, really. She's always quiet and thoughtful, except when she's laughing. Tell me, do you have any girlfriends? Well, not many. What do you think about girls? Not much. <coughs> when you decided to have the five, did you want to have them close together? Yeah, because if you separate each kids, you say one is 15 and one is six, I and mean, there's such an age gap that they, they could never get on. They never grow up together, they won't know each other. Why did you want to have a large family? Well, I wouldn't really call it a large family. <laughs> well, I think it is large by it. Average standards. Yeah. We just want the five kids. You know, we got exactly what we want: three boys and two girls. So we. You gonna have any more? No, no, no. It's exactly that. It's a handful, you know. Do you push your kids at school? Those that go to school already. No, I don't push them. I encourage them on what they they come home when they come home, and I come home in the evening. They tell me what they've done. You know, if they've done anything bad, I, t I tell them where they've gone wrong. And if they want, um, what's the word, not encouragement, uh, praise for what they've done, then I'll give it to them if they've done well, yeah. Do you see maybe your kids are going to be smarter than you are? Oh, uh, yeah, there's a couple of them already look like they're going to be smarter. Well, how are you going to handle that? Um, keep them on my side. They say, uh, where's your father then? You know, when your mum's out at work, they tell your father. And I just tell him I ain't got one. What effect has that had on you? Well, I don't think it's had any effect on me, because... what you don't have, you don't miss. And the... 20 years ago, uh, when I was born, uh, you know, I, an illegitimate child, you know, th that's something that's only whispered about. People, you know, feel strongly about it in those days, but nowadays you, it's... It's not a serious matter. The serious point is, is whether you stay with somebody or you leave them. What would you like to give your children that you never had? They've got everything there. They've even got what I never had. So. Which is what? A father, isn't it? So, I mean, they've had everything. I feel like bundling when there's already a gut, when there's already a fight. I always feel like that. Simon was brought up in a children's home. He went back to live with his mother when he was 13. I was at a boarding school and I liked the discipline. That gave me a kind of freedom. And do you encourage that with your children? Yeah, I do encourage that. They go to bed the same time every night and they get up round about the same time every morning and they go to school the same time every day you know it's good to have discipline and routine but, but what about in your life do you think there's been too much routine 
No, not really. I mean, somebody else might think so, yeah, but I enjoyed having a routine. I enjoyed knowing where I was going to be next and what I had to do next because that sort of relieved me from responsibilities. At 21, he was working in the freezer room of Wall's Sausages in London. How do you see the future as far as work goes? Well, I, I know I can't stay at Wall's forever. I mean, it's just not me. I, I couldn't stay there f for that long. I'd, my mind would go dead. How long have I been there? About eight or nine years or something like that. There's a lot of people I know there now. When I first went there, I mean, it's getting to know people. Now that I've been there so long, I mean, I know practically everybody who's in there. Now, it's, I don't think your mind could go dead because I've got a lot to talk about every day I go to work, you know? There's always somebody says something smart, you know? I'm just wondering. Be just any, like anybody else, you know? Nothing too, too marvellous. I feel OK just getting on with life, just sort of keeping up. But uh, I know if I really wanted to, I could get on. Yeah, it only take a little spark in me to, to do it. I'm quite happy to stay there. It doesn't look like it's going to close down, so I mean... Better the devil you know, isn't it? I mean, do you never fear you should be doing better jobs than these? Aren't you worth more than this? No, I haven't really. I, I suppose I just like hard work, I don't know. But uh, it's never really sort of worried me. I suppose it should, but it just hasn't. Not really interested in moving up the scale. Why? I don't need the hassle of being a charger, manager, or whatever. I had one dream when when all the world was on top top of me, and everything was on it. And, and I just about got out and everything flew up in the air. It la all landed on my head. See, I mean, everybody's got the same start. They've got a the little bit of grey matter in their head and it depends how they use it and for what purpose. Yeah? If you're, not go if you're just going to be like me, take it easy through life, okay, you yeah. If you're going to be somebody who really wants to go far, well, you have to push yourself. If you don't push yourself, you won't go up. And do you want to go far, push yourself? Um, no, I want to get through life nice and easy. Simon and his family live in a council flat in Southall, London. What do you think about rich people? Well, not much. Tell me, love. Well, they think they can do everything without you doing it as well. Rich people, they have all different things have everything they want, whereas poor people, they don't have nothing and they know they and they know they haven't got nothing. And so they know they're missing something. What are you missing? Well, I'm missing a, a bike and a, a fishing rod and Are you envious of people who have a lot of money? No, I may have been but I can't envy them now because I've got what I want, so there's nothing that anybody can give me that's going to make me any happier. I could save for months and then just one day just go out and spend it and that's it. I would feel quite happy about it. I wouldn't worry about getting the next penny. If you don't plan anything, you would, you'll never get by anyway. You could have millions in you, you won't know what you're going to do with it. If you just keep spending it, you have to know what you're spending. Get used to knowing colour people and colour people in turn have got to get used to being with white people. Because if, if either side doesn't work properly, then no side will work properly. They're just the same as me, aren't they? I mean, do you think it's hard being a black man in English society today? <laughs> it depends what you want, innit? If you just want to live in the society, no, it's not hard. If you want to fight the society, yes, it would be hard. And have you ever wanted to fight it? Not really, no. There's no need for it. I've been to Madame Tussauds with my mum in the planetarium as well. Do you want to go abroad? Um, yeah. I'd like to go to uh, Mallorca. 
take a couple of weeks out there from everything. Relax myself. I think I might like to sort of go out of this country. Probably just the, for a holiday first, somewhere, anywhere. And then sort of think about settling down somewhere else. I mean, I could have got a job in some foreign parts, working for an automation packing firm. But when it came down to it, I didn't want to move, I didn't want to leave. So, I mean, I probably got a very narrow view of life, because I don't really like travelling. Does that worry you, that you have that narrow view? Worry me? You keep asking me if things worry me. No. Um, Does it concern you, then? Yeah, that's a different word. Uh, no, not really. It doesn't really concern me. And what do you want for the future? Watching my kids grow up, and when they're growing up, maybe seeing their children grow up as well. Looking at some of the earlier films, it would seem that maybe you had a sad childhood and you didn't have a dad and you didn't have a lot of material things. No, I wouldn't really call that a sad life. It's a different life to somebody with everything or thinks they have everything, but I mean, it doesn't matter if you've got everything, all the material things in the world. I mean, you're not going to be happy anyway because you still want the next thing down the road. At the end of their very special day in London, after their trip to the zoo and the party, we took our children to an adventure playground where they could do just what they liked. Those from the children's home set about building a house. There's Nicholas. Andrew and Bruce. Jackie and her friends. Give me a child until he is seven, and I will give you the man. This has been a glimpse of Britain's future.